welcome to the 38th annual Around the NFL Podcast Fantasy Extravaganza with special guests Marcus Grant, Liz Loza, that's L as in look, it's Liz Loza, O as in oh my god is that Liz Loza, Z as in zesty Liz Loza, and A as in aw yeah. Liz Loza, Rotopat, Patrick Doherty, The Big Fish, Evan Silva, and introduced last in accordance with his ironclad contract writer, Brick by Brick, Greg Rosenthal. <laughs> and now, your host and two-time League of Record champion in 18 tries, Dan <laughs> Hansu. <laughs> Thank you, Matt Money Smith, and that is defending League of Record champion Dan Hanzoos. It is not my defending. league of record. Well, we all have our own leagues of record, and uh, yes, the fantasy extravaganza is here, Greg, and uh, and the theme of this year's episode is perfect. How do you be perfect on draft day? How do you have the perfect? fantasy season that's what we're here to deliver and greg you did indeed as you tell us all the time help build roto world into a giant in the fantasy sector anything i didn't say anything and i know you're not involved with fantasy as much anymore or at all i should say but i know this episode holds a special place in your heart it does i mean um i don't like it when silva Makes little comments on Twitter, establish the run. I've you know I've done his pod a couple times where he's like, "Oh, you're an old man. You're out of the game." He doesn't even respect my <laughs> opinions anymore. I get you know I think Roto Pat probably feels the same. Another you know former coworker of mine. I I hope Liz Loza respects me. I know we respect her. I mean, she got a lot more pop than Marcus on the intro, and uh, you know we've done this show for eight plus years. I didn't think you could surprise me anymore with how it opens, but that that was incredible. <laughs> What a talent Matt Money Smith is uh, as a as a host, but I have a feeling you wrote those words. I did not write the Liz Loza uh, bit. That was improv Wait, really? by Money. Yeah, that that one took me by surprise. It's a little if you're uh, a fan of Family Guy, a, a, a rather famous Robert Loggia uh, bit from that show. Uh, but yes, this is um, and Liz does not respect you. By the way, just to answer the question, no, probably not. I get it. I get it. You got to be in the. Why is it though? What is it about? You're either in or you're out. But here's what I'm. I would say to defend myself: when you're out, I think you get a different perspective. That when all those fantasy guys in the bunker, and maybe Marcus will come on soon. We'll talk about that. There's a little bit of a hive mind, and even though they try to get out of it, it's like, oh, this guy is average ADP. 53, but I have him 39, and it's like, ooh, that's a strong take. Well, how about like. You know, I have him 15, like, because that's what reality could be. Like, reality is going to be way bigger in terms of surprises and anomalies than any of these rankings are ever going to be. So get some stones, fantasy analysts. That's what I Wow, I like that. Greg hitting out against, biting the (laughs) hand that once fed him and built his career, really. I mean, he built his career off the back of fantasy sports. Uh, But that's, that's just Greg. That's just Greg. But do you think I, I would have done it? I would have done it forever if um, I didn't get some other opportunity that felt like, oh, let's do something different. Let's not be in 17 leagues and be totally stressed out. Me, me and Wes, we both had that experience where we got a little burnt out. That fantasy right. didn't feel as fun anymore. Um, just, you know, when, it, when it's your job, when football's fun, but fantasy but, became a little bit of a job. Now, you love you love ball and you closely follow every team. Do you really think, you know, I know you're not active in fantasy leagues anymore, but do you think you would, the Greg of 2010 or whatever it was, would kick the Greg of 2021's ass? I mean, is it really that different in terms of football knowledge versus fantasy football knowledge? No, I don't think so. I mean, luck is easily the most uh, important factor in a fantasy league, and everyone that comes on today will admit it. And plus, you know, I still got those, like, I still got the, the... the experience. If I jump back in, I jump in back all the way, and that would be to win some money. Luck is very important, and as I said, I did win my league of record last year, even though I had Carson Wentz and Ben Roethlisberger as my uh, two quarterbacks, because you know what else I had? Alvin Kamara. The greatest championship performance of all time in Week 16, those six touchdowns against the Vikings. I still uh, smile when I think back to that. I believe it was Christmas Day? Oh, yeah. 
Unbelievable. Anyway, enough of that. What? Did you hear that, Craig? What is that? I think we got something on the line. <laughs> I think, oh, I think it's a big one. <laughs> That's the big fish. The, the biggest. biggest of all fish. Evan yeah. Silva is our first guest on the Fantasy Extravaganza. And how fitting, Evan from EstablishTheRun.com. Dude, how are you? Thank you for joining us again. This is officially a tradition on the ATN podcast. Yeah, I think we've done this almost five years at this point. And keeping the tradition alive, It's the, the season is inching closer. I spent my entire morning uh, adjusting uh, rankings for the – uh, the Sony Michelle trade, and things are things are starting to get real. So I'm, I'm excited. Those, those, those are, it's a tough month. August is sneaky, the worst month for yes. a, a fantasy guru like Evan Silva because of just the constant draft kit updates and yeah. all that stuff. But he is he is literally the biggest of fish, as as I've probably said on this show before uh, when I first met him after already being his boss for three years. And found out he's actually six seven and three hundred and twenty five pounds. Uh, I had to start changing my tone on instant message. Had to start changing. My tone. <laughs> um, Evan, you know, it, it, seriously, like a draft or a fantasy season doesn't start until we have to reconsider where Daryl Henderson fits in mm-hmm. in the um, pro football landscape. But you know, we're going to get into some sleepers and busts, and again, establish the run. Um, Evan and Adam Leventon run that together. And uh, Silva has a column up this week, Sleepers and Undervalued. And I highly recommend you uh, check that out and check that website out ahead of your big drafts. And I guess before we get into some sleepers and busts for 2021, I have like an overarching question uh, for you because I don't think there are many people in this sphere that are more respected than the big fish. How much to you when it comes to succeeding and the whole theme of today's episode, had having the perfect fantasy draft how much um goes back to preparation and how much goes mm. to reacting in the moment mm-hmm. on draft day as mike tyson once said you know everybody has a plan till you get punched in the mouth mm-hmm. is preparation o- overrated or do you need that component how does it break down to you well i think that uh from an overall uh fantasy success standpoint I think that the draft itself is actually overrated. Now, mm. it's the most fun part of the entire process, okay? And, and, you know, except for maybe winning in your championship game. But, and, but so much leads up into it that it, it feels like it's a lot more important than it is. I would say it's about 35% of the battle. Wow. And I think that the waiver wire, working the waiver wire – and getting guys off of them, being diligent every single week. You know, most waiver wire runs occur on Tuesday or Wednesday night. Um, making sure that you are on top of that waiver wire every single week, I think, is the true key to success because, you know, you can actually build a, a team going wide receiver heavy and then, and then making uh, critical running back pickups during the year and building like a super team. This is how these, these notions of zero running back and – um, you know, anchor running back, uh, the, these new strategies have come about because people have figured out that especially, you know, with so many leagues moving to, toward full PPR and stressing more flex spots and starting more receivers, you know, traditionally uh, leagues would just start like two running backs, two wide receivers, one tight end, you know, ship it, you know, a, a kicker and a defense. Now teams are, are, are or leagues are, are using – three wide receivers, two flexes, full PPR, you know, so building around wide, re- wide receiver early builds and then using the waiver wire to pick up running backs during the season, that's the way to really build a super team. So in other words, a good draft strategy is focus on building super positional groups and then then you could really focus in your waiver wire um, quest uh, on the position group that you maybe didn't overlook, but you purposely went away from on draft day. Yes, but it's also, and you also have to consider that it's really hard to find like a wide receiver one off the waiver wire. You know, that, that really doesn't happen. I mean, generally speaking, like big time wide receivers, we know who they are. They're going to be in the starting lineup. Year. That was that, the last time it happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really rare. <laughs> and, and, and teams are also running more three and four receiver sets. So they're just getting a bunch of more wide receivers 
out there on the field. It's much easier to find a, a productive running back all the waiver wire than it is a wide receiver. And I think that connects to the sleepers and busts we're going to get to now, because to me, the value is, is never is not at running back at all. Like, so all the sleepers mm-hmm. and the value to me feels like they're at the receivers and, and, and some at the quarterback position. But I'm going to answer your question too, Dan, because I thought it was such a good one. I think the preparation is important, but it's like, it's like Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes' preparation. No one prepares more than them. But then once they get to the game, it's like you got to just do it by feel and you got to do it by like all that study. And like, you know, it, it still has like a little improvis- in other words, improvisational need, magic that you need. You to need that subscription to establish a run dot com, yeah. obviously. Uh, but that's not the whole battle. OK, sleepers and bus. Evan Silva. Who's the guy? Like, who's the guy? Ooh. And I even, you know, I in my league of record, I have people that listen to this show and I actually don't like that. And I don't think it's fair. Uh, but I feel like as the host of the show, I, I need to kind of give myself that competitive disadvantage for the listeners because I would love to know Evan Silva's favorite sleepers this year, the guys that I should be targeting uh, later this month. Like, who are the guys that really jump out to you right now? Well, I, I'm going to go like with, with some deeper sleepers here. And yeah, I'm going to start that. off with a guy who's, you know, has been near and dear to your heart, Dan. Uh, may, maybe no longer, but he's a guy by the name of Sam Darnold. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. And so okay. We, we know that the <laughs> post, <laughs> well, that's what most people are going to say. He doesn't even get drafted in most drafts. And I think that he's going to be a quarterback that people may, may pick up off the waiver wire early in the season because I think he's going to start fast. Because first of all, he's got a really soft schedule coming out of the gate. Okay. Week one against the Jets, who have one of the worst cornerback units in the league, just lost Carl Lawson, their best pass rusher. Week two against the Saints. You know, Dennis Allen's defense on a, on a regular basis starts off slow, winds up be, becoming the strength of the team. Uh, but if that happens again, I think that that's going to be a favorable matchup uh, for Sam Darnold in week two at Houston in week three, playing indoors in all likelihood against one of the worst defense in, in the league. At Dallas, we know that that is another potential game indoors where uh, the, D- Dallas is not an imposing defense whatsoever. And then against Philadelphia in week five. We know that the post Adam Gase effect has had a, a tangible uh, impact on several players uh, over the over the past couple seasons. Just getting away from Adam Gase has had a positive impact on their production. I believe in Joe Brady last year with less talent than Joe Brady will be working with this year. The Panthers finished top ten in yards per drive. Christian McCaffrey's back. DJ Moore is a budding superstar. Terrace Marshall looks like he should have been a top ten pick. And Robbie Anderson, who just got the big contract, reunited with Sam Darnold. Um, So I think that if you are in a position where you want to take, like, let's say Justin Fields or Trey Lance, and you think that they're eventually, you know, once they get in there, they're going to be top five, top ten fantasy quarterbacks. But you need somebody to sort of build a bridge to those guys that you can get for cheap and – uh, will be productive early in the season. I, I think that Sam Darnold is a v- is a very cost effective effective. I like option. that, but but like Dan's league, you start two quarterbacks, so that's a great great sleeper. And it just, okay, your excellent. League, yes. Your league structure changes, but are you really going to start if you're in a one quarterback league? You really going to start Sam Darnold in those four four weeks? Probably not. I mean, what what good does it do for you? I'd rather because I don't see him, and I think you disagree, Silva as a guy who could potentially be in the top five, you know, that's who I would want to take as a sleeper or t- potentially top eight. And you mentioned the rookies. And at this point, it seems like people are drafting Lance and fields high enough where it, you know, they they cost a lot. Like you're going to have to take them as your legit QB two. I don't care. Like I kind of hope Trey Lance doesn't win the starting job and that, you know, pushes his value even lower and you take them and that's fine. And you just stash them because he could be a top five guy. Fields could be a top five guy. And the other one that got circled a little bit, uh, that isn't too high is Matt Ryan. I, I think he could be a top five guy because that defense is so bad. And I, I think the offensive coaching is going to be so good. That defense uh, in the NFC South, those secondaries for other than Tampa are terrible. And uh, you can just see Matt Ryan putting up 4,500, 5,000 yards in like a seven and 10 season that the Falcons aren't particularly good, but you can see him finishing QB five, QB six. Usually you don't have a former MVP in this type of conversation, but I, I get that. Matt Ryan is a little bit under the radar um, right now. A little breaking news that just uh, went down as we're recording this. 
Evan, uh, Teddy Bridgewater named the starting quarterback of the Broncos. Good for him. He earned it. Um, do you think, because, all right, listen, the, the Teddy replaced by Sam Darnold. Do you think Teddy is a potential sleeper in Ooh. that offense? There are a lot of good pieces in Denver. Uh, is he a guy that you can go get uh, very deep in the draft and end up getting nice return on him? Well, I think that one of the reasons that the Broncos named Teddy Bridgewater their starting quarterback, and it's something that I anticipated happening because, first of all, George Patton, you know, the new GM, brought him over. He knows Pat Shermer from Minnesota. But I think that one of the reasons they, – they believe that he is a better option to manage games than is Drew Locke. And Drew Locke is, you know, a turnover machine. I mean, this guy led the NFL in interceptions, didn't even – you know, what he started, like 75% of the games last year. He's been fumble prone. Um, and I think that Teddy Bridgewater is just a better option and not give the ball to the other team. The Broncos are going to have a great defense. They're getting back Von Miller, Bradley Chubbs healthy. They've got four stop starting caliber cornerbacks. They've got uh, an excellent safety duo. You know, that's how they're going to play. They're, he's going to be a game manager, whereas I think that Sam Darnold is going to be more aggressive mm. in Carolina. I, I prefer Sam Darnold. I also think that Sam Darnold is going to have the job all year, whereas if Bridgewater starts to flounder a little bit, like they'll be they'll be quick on the trigger to go to Drew Locke. I think he could help though KJ Hamler and Javante Williams, who would be two of my sleepers. Well, I think he's a really good fit with Jerry Judy because right. I think that um, Teddy Bridgewater will pull the trigger. Like whereas I think that Drew Locke, he's kind of he's a little more of a chucker, and he would have been more positive for Cortland Sutton with Teddy Bridgewater when he sees it come open and Jerry Judy can get open. Like Bridgewater's going to go to that when he sees the guy come open. I think Jerry Judy could have 100 catches this year. People should pay attention to these preseason reports because that's where you find out that Cortland Sutton is not all the way back from his that too, torn ACL. Right. And you see K.J. Hamler, who I, I think could end up having, you know, in uh, Silva's, you know, establish the run type uh, terms, spike weeks. You know, a best ball guy that has, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he's not the best guy all season, but he'll rip off 330-yard games where he has like a 70-yard touchdown. I could see that. And I love Agreed. the way Javante Williams – runs and you mentioned judy i don't know if he fits on sleepers and bust but like that's where you look at the running back versus receiver value and oh my god i love jerry judy and the fact that he's in the sixth round i mean everyone knows jerry judy but i'd rather have him than the running backs taken in the third or the fourth round so I, well, i'm was, with you just stack up those receivers i love me some that jerry was also judy the, late, Javante. the late chris wessling was big on that too don't go get the wide receiver uh i don't know let's i'll throw a, a jameson crowder or um, most of new a couple of years ago, kind of mm-hmm. a wide receiver three type guy. Go for a Jerry Judy type that has mm-hmm. more of a ceiling. Now, Evan, um, let's talk about some busts, okay? Uh, because uh, let's start in on the higher end of things, like the guys that are projected to go in the top 20. Okay. Is there anybody in that group to you that stands Ooh. out as someone with some big red flags right now? Yeah, and you know, we, over, over the over the past couple of years at Established the Run, we esta- we've established a lot of things. And one of them was the, the <laughs> Ten the Commandments, run. the Ten Commandments of Fantasy. And for a while there, uh, the number one commandment was that thou shalt not fade the big dog. Okay. And the big dog is Derrick Henry. Um, but things have things change year to year. And now the big dog is entering his sixth season. He's led the league in carries in back to back years, a ton of wear and tear on his tires. He's entering a transitioning offense uh that added Julio Jones and Swapped out Arthur Smith, who I thought was brilliant, for Todd Downing, who ran the Raiders in 2017, and the Raiders ranked 30th in the NFL in rushing attempts. And now he's incentivized to call more pass plays because he's got Julio Jones and A.J. Brown. The defense is terrible. This is a team that's going to be trailing uh, Mm. a lot more often than last year when they outkicked Mm. their Pythagorean win expectation by almost three games. They were not as good as their final record. Never thought I'd see it, the big fish yeah, fading I the know. big dog. And, and, and over the course of his career, uh, Derrick Henry has averaged 106 total, one yard, uh, 106 total yards and over one touchdown per game and wins only 50 yards and 0.3 TDs in losses. You're not going to get – he hasn't had a 20-catch a season in college or the pros. That's almost a decade worth of sample size. So I think that this is going to be the year that we see the big dog fall. Ooh. Mm. Anybody else in that kind of group of stars? How about Aaron? Aaron Jones is a top ten pick with the talent that he has behind him. I, I'd be a little, yeah. a little bit of offensive line questions, but it, it's really more about 
you know, you're counting on touchdowns and then you're also counting on AJ Dillon, not to be a factor. AJ Dillon looks good. Kylan Hill is a great, mm-hmm. is a great looking third running back. Why not just save Aaron Jones as much as you can if you're the Packers for the playoffs, which is basically what they do. You're counting on a lot of touchdowns, a lot of explosive plays out of him. Like that's a, that's another spot where so many of these running backs towards the top, I'd rather have a receiver there. Zeke, Zeke and Saquon would be another two. I mean, you you make a fair argument. I think that Aaron Jones at the end of the day, like he's going to be really, really good uh, in, in a really good offense. He's excellent in the passing game. A.J. Dillon doesn't do what Jamal Williams did in the passing game. Uh, so I think we're going to see a better player that. though. You can just Maybe. tell he's a better player. I really yeah, he, think he could be. We'll, really. we'll see. Uh, one, one bust I have toward the middle rounds is Kenny Galladay. Mm. And you know, the, the history of wide receivers changing teams in the, in the off season uh, has not been great. Now it went really well for DeAndre Hopkins and Stefan Diggs last year. So it, it's not, you know, it, it's not a, a foolproof uh, uh, process to just completely write off uh, wide receivers that are changing You were teams. big on that last year, Fish. Yes, you were not right. high on Hopkins. I, and I was a fish, you know, la- last year. So, <laughs> um, But this year, not, not going to be a fish. And Kenny Galladay is, uh, uh, I mean, not, not only is he changing teams, but he hasn't gotten any practice time in with his new quarterback mm. who took a step back last year. It's a Jason Garrett offense. You know, we haven't seen Kenny Galladay play football really in a long time. He played in four games. Has last like year. a bust of a contract year ever hurt a guy less, like in terms of fantasy value or the money right. he got from the Giants? Like Kenny Galladay yeah. didn't do anything for you last year for anyone. Yeah, exactly. And the downgrade, I think, from Matthew Stafford to Daniel Jones is going to be significant. So I think that Galladay might have, might he, he might mix in a few spiked weeks, but you're, he's, you're really going to struggle for inconsistency. The guy that no one wants to draft in the Giants' pass catcher core, and I think still has a stable role, is Sterling Shepard. I think that he ends up – I mean, he he goes undrafted uh, quite a bit, and I think he's going to end up with 85 catches. Man, I've been wrong on Sterling Shepard every year, and I'm going to just keep being wrong until I'm finally right. It's going to be right one of these years. All right, and before we say goodbye to the big fish, is there any other players – um, you could throw out a sleeper or bus category that you're give really us some rapid fire. So yeah, just throw us- out a lot of names uh, either way. All right. I mean, I, I was on Marquez Callaway before, you know, he started burning up the preseason. And I think that he is an excellent sleeper. And he's a guy that in home leagues where maybe some of your competitors have not been paying as much attention to the preseason, mm-hmm. he might end up going late. Now, if you look at in the high stakes leagues, he's, he started to go like in the ninth round, but you might, you, you probably can get him a little bit later in your leagues at home. I think that Devontae Parker his ADP is wide receiver 55. I have him as the wide receiver 40. Mm. He's a, a good value. Cole Komet, uh, I think, is an excellent number two tight end. I think he's rarely going to come off the field this season. If you want to go a little bit deeper for a sleeper tight end, Donald Parham, uh, who the beat writers say is cutting into Jared Cook's role already. Jared Cook is old, falling off the cliff, cliff 34 years old. Donald Parham only caught 10 balls last year. But three of them were for touchdowns. This guy's six foot nine. He was the best player in the XFL. Dan, I, I'm sure you caught a bunch of those XFL games. I know how you love the AAF. Yeah, I, yeah, I was the AAF guy personally. But I, but I, but in this offense, if Donald Parham can ca- can carve out a role where he's playing like sixty percent of the snaps, which I think that he can do. Mm. Um, I mean, the Chargers offense is one to bet on this year. I'm amazed Noah fans tight end nine or ten. I know he's uh, had a, I guess, a little banged up. Uh, camp but keep take guys that can be the the number one player at the position yeah there is a there is a scenario where Noah fan is tight end one or tight end three or whatever sure. it is so just just take them because that's going to be 11 12th round i love you Let, last thing for me um is thank you evan silva for joining us it is the first day of school uh for so many parents uh, across the country including evan and myself uh, and you have a wonderful daughter to go pick up so thank you for making the time buddy and best of luck and everybody go to the establish the com. i gotta get in the car all right go, later buddy go. thanks Where's for having me all right thank you there he goes greggy the big fish the largest of all fish and by the way if you want to take this moment here to do your little victory celebration about your boy teddy bridgewater a little Woo! ted talk for greg rosenthal because he's got a shot here to lead a very promising broncos team I, I got to admit, that was bad po- podcasting uh, by me during that 
segment because I'm scrambling. We're trying to get Evan Silva out on time. I'm looking for sleepers and busts, and I don't think the enormity of Teddy Bridgewater <laughs> taking that job quite hit me yet. So let's just celebrate it right now. Let's go. <laughs> like, I'm a Patriots fan. If the Patriots and the Broncos are, are playing, I'm going to root for the Patriots. But this year, I'm a Broncos fan. Already was getting there. And now with this news, I don't need any more. They, they were once the team of West TL. Um, but now they, I don't need to wait till the season starts to see how they look. They are the team of THAL, Rosenthal. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm all in on the Broncos. They're going to the playoffs. I think they'll win a playoff game. This Everything I wanted from Teddy last year in Carolina is going to happen with this great roster in Denver. Love it. You know, you, you often mock me for going third person. But this, you know, if I went to a patent office right now and I find out that team of THAL is already registered, I'll know that you're Machiavellian. I think I broke it out once now, but now, yeah, it's, it's sticking. I don't know if is I can get team you guys on board. I mean, I just was trying to make it rhyme with West TL or ATL. There's really no way. But uh, I, I believe it. I mean, I do. I have fun with Teddy. I think it's okay to root for players. Not everyone that you root for has to be the best player in the league. Um, but oh. I really do think this roster is Super Bowl ready if they had Aaron Rodgers and playoff ready with a little Teddy. And, and don't get it twisted. And I know we, we've been at crossover Teddy Bridgewater, but I, I've never had anything against Teddy. In fact, he's a great story and a great comeback story and by all accounts, a really good dude. So it, I, I'm really torn because I'd like to see your analysis go up in flames and him struggle, <laughs> and that would bring me a lot of joy personally. But also, if Teddy <laughs> thrives, that's a nice thing too because he's a good dude who deserves it. I appreciate now. the honesty. I think after eight years, we're just now more <laughs> honest with each other. That's good. Speaking of good dudes, our next guest is a mainstay on NFL Network, NFL.com, the Fantasy Podcast. You see him all over the dial this time of year. And now we welcome him back to the Around the NFL podcast. He is the great Marcus Grant. Man, stuff like that never happens to me. Man, stuff like that never happens to anybody except for Marcus. Yeah, how about Marcus <laughs> Grant in a boomerang reboot, you in the Eddie role. How about that? That was that was sort of my life in in like junior high and high school after that movie came out because especially because his name was Marcus Graham so oh. it was really close to my name so like you don't know how many people would just walk up to me in like high school and just go Maka so that was that was my life as a teenager well you could have you could have worse role models for sure I know this reference is too old uh, for Erica but I, I love it. Boomerang so much yes, I it was like my favorite. Uh, 1992 movie to watch when it was on <laughs> HBO. Uh, there are just so many great lines in it and a great cast. And I just want I want Marcus in the Marcus Graham role. And I don't think that's asking too much. In I'm fine with it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, all right, Marcus, welcome back. Uh, you're as rock solid as it gets in the industry. Well, there's only, but even though Evan Silva is the big fish, we He's only big have fish, big man. fish on this show, and uh, you're a big one indeed. And I just want to say, Marcus. We are breaking it down kind of by tiers here. Or I'm not saying to you, Marcus, but the audience. Uh, so, Evan, we focused on the sleepers and bus and some overall fantasy philosophy uh, with Mr. Grant, wide receivers and tight ends. What do you feel about this positional group? Um, overarching thoughts as we get into the conversation. Well, you can't pick two more different positional groups in terms of depth. Wide receiver is by far the deepest, and tight end is easily the thinnest. So it it's sort of I've taken two different approaches with it, where I, I tend to go very early on tight ends. I've drafted Travis Kelsey in the first round in countless wow. drafts this off season. Um, you know, if I don't get him, then I'm fine with a Darren Waller or George Kittle somewhere in the first couple three rounds. A uh, tight end or a wide receiver, rather, you can sort of wait on because there is such depth. A lot of times, I might not go until the fourth round before I get my first wide receiver just because there are still plenty of quality players mm. there, and I can feel okay about it. I want four, I want four or five wide receivers, though. Like, I mean, that, that are good, <laughs> like top 40 wide receivers. I want four or five because injuries are going to happen. Hopefully, you got a flex spot, especially if you got a flex and three receiver starters. I, I was really surprised out of, as a fantasy outsider, Marcus, to see mm. – when I checked in on the ADP, wow, Travis Kelsey's going 12th. Because to, to me, it's like, I don't know, he's always been Travis Kelsey. He's never gone 12th before. So I don't want him the year that he is going 12th. Because to me, <laughs> nothing's different about him. He's still the same guy. He's great. You're locking in 
a tough position. I get it, but you know, I mentioned Noah Fant. There's other guys, Mark Andrews. There's plenty of breakout type guys that I feel like you could get later when you can just stack up those like superstar receivers at the top if you can get them. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anything has changed with Travis Kelsey. I think things have changed with us. It's that yeah. every year we kept trying to tell ourselves that you know what, tight end's going to be deeper this year. It's going to be deeper this year, and it never was. We we would always come into August thinking that hey, you know what, there's going to be these mid round tight ends. And at least a couple of them are going to pop. And then we get to October and we're like, this is a morass and this is awful. And why did we think this? So I think instead of just morass. foregoing all that, yeah. you like that? Yeah. Uh, instead, of, instead, we decided to forego that. And we're like, you know what? There are three guys that we know we can count on. At this point, just make the leap and reach for them. So it's not that, it's not that I think Travis Kelsey has gotten better or Darren Waller or George Kittle. They're all really good. Uh, it's just that I think okay. a lot of us are sick of sort of, you know, throwing darts at the Mike Gasickis of the world and hoping that something great comes of that. It's a strong argument because if you think about it, it, it kind of mirrors the Marcus Grant career trajectory. Nothing's changed with Marcus Grant. Like he's always <laughs> been a fantasy, fantasy analyst one, but it just took a while for the NFL to realize it and start pushing him up that draft board, put him no, to the relate. top of the jet chart put him on tv more i'm seeing you in the pre it's it's great so you you are mr kelsey marcus and i are grinders in the nfl media sphere we we just rose up (laughs) um just uh through pure effort hey speaking of tight ends so yeah we all know the big three and i'm looking at um an adp site to trust a fantasy football calculator and i see kyle pitts and i see him going according to their rankings average draft position top 50 that is a fourth round pick. Yeah. Kyle Pitts. Now, where does he where do where for you is that a guy that you want to invest a still that's a premium draft pick those first five mm-hmm. picks in a rookie. Now, a rookie that people say can transform the position, but are you willing to get in on the ground floor with Kyle Pitts that early in a draft? I'm not I I look I completely understand the arguments of people who do. I'm just not one of them. I've got him Kind of as my sixth tight end, right? You've got your big three, and then whatever order you want to put Mark Andrews and TJ Hawkinson, that's fine with me. And then mm. I've got Kyle Pitts there. Everybody, you know, we, we a lot of times, you know, set these expectations for players. Last year, you know, Clyde Edward Delaire, I think, was a victim of our expectations mm. where people overdrafted him because of what we thought he could be. And I sort of worry that about Kyle Pitts because um, we have set his, his standard arbitrarily somewhere just south of like Saturn. Um, and, and for him to kind of hit that, if you're drafting him as the fourth tight end off the board, you were expecting him to hit his absolute ceiling and history just kind of shows us that that doesn't happen with tight ends. And, and because we have set that ceiling so high, it just feels really difficult for him to get there. I think even if he is very good, which I expect, I just don't think it's going to be where people uh, are anticipating him being. I think next year, I think we can talk about that, but I think this year, I would have him as my sixth tight end, maybe draft him somewhere a few rounds later, which basically boils down to I'm not going to draft him because he's going to be gone before that opportunity comes. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I, I You saying that Hawkinson was in that next three, That's a, it's another one as a fantasy outsider. I'm like, what? Wait, that he's in that three? Because <laughs> I, I just do think about, like, which, which guys who do you want on your real team? I do think people get a little caught up in the situations more. Noah Fant is a better football player than TJ mm-hmm. Hawkinson. It's not even close in terms of fantasy skills in terms of a receiver so it's like why it so is mark andrews i don't even think they're in the same ballpark maybe hawkinson changes he develops and he's in a great situation but i don't get that i'm going to throw a question by you marcus because i i want to get this take out there it's my number mm. one fantasy take of the of the year so it's not really a question it's just a platform no. for Greg to play <laughs> it, along with. it's ball the question is like the guy that you can't draft at wide receiver too early that there is no too early for this guy that if Marcus has 20 teams, you're happy that he's on 17 of them, you know, but, uh, but usually a pretty good guy for me, without any doubt, it's Terry McLaurin. Mm. I I don't think you can take Terry McLaurin too high. Mm. I think if he's, you're at the top of the second round, I don't care. That's not too early for him. You want to take him in the first round. I don't even care. Like I would put, (laughs) I would put Devante Adams ahead of him, maybe Stefan Diggs, and that's it. And and sometimes I think you get caught up in like, oh, let's beat the ADP by four or five spots or whatever. 
I personally just think he is going to have a monster season with with Fitzpatrick. I think 1,500 yards is like absolutely within reach. And so, to me, I couldn't take him too early. If I was drafting, I'm just going to take him in every draft. That's the guy I'm staking my claim to. Do you have a guy like that at wide receiver? Uh, I do. Well, first off, I you know I don't think you're crazy with the McLaurin take there. He you know okay. when when the, the the football team went out and got Ryan Fitzpatrick, everybody who was already high on Terry McLaurin just went to the moon about him just because we know what Ryan Fitzpatrick can be and what that that's what I thought. And then I looked and he's still like the eighth or ninth receiver in the end yeah. of the third round. And that surprised me because to me, the moon is like wide receiver one. I think that's possible. You think it's like a, <laughs> th- a football team tax here? That just, Cause I, yeah. I'm, I'm guilty yeah. of this. Like when I think about it and I look at the top five or six receivers that are going Adams, Hill, Diggs, Hopkins, Ridley, Metcalf, Jefferson, Scary Terry's not there. Is it because he's got a bad nickname? Is it because Washington's <laughs> offense has just been so uninspiring for decades now that it's turning off basics like me? I think I think it's some of that. I also just think it's, you know, a lot of times it's muscle memory, right? When you see that, you know, Devontae Adams, Stefan Diggs, Tyreek Hills, those guys, uh, it's just we have become accustomed to drafting those guys as the first handful of players off the board. And, and it's hard to do that. It's hard to sort of break away from that. And so maybe that has something to do with it. But uh, I mean, to answer your question, for me, uh, it's C.D. Lamb. I mean, it's, you know, same division uh, on a team that I think is going to throw the football a ton, on a team that has become certainly more Dak-centered over the years, uh, and on a team that defensively I don't expect them to be you know, a ton better than they were last year. So I think the, the Cowboys are going to be in a lot of track meets, which means uh, you're going to have Dak throwing the ball a lot. And this talk that they want to move Lamb all over the formation, you know, get him just you know, outside of just being in the slot and get him outside a little bit. Um, you know, I, I also think he's definitely getting a hard knocks bump, um, hmm. you know, with, with some of those highlights and stuff we're seeing there. But but C.D. Lamb is a guy that I have been trying to draft in as many places. And it, it's been, you know, a lot of virtual fist fights because everybody's kind of feeling this way about C.D. Lamb. Well, hear me out on that. Devil's advocate on this because um, this is out there as a thought as well. Amari Cooper, I mean, he's going to get his targets. He's got to eat. You have Michael Gallup. Also in that mix, you have Zeke Elliott. He's getting to me a hard knocks bump as well, where it looks like he's it's going to be a good Zeke season potentially. And, you know, that's going to lead to a lot of touches for him. Is there not enough footballs to go around to make CD Lamb the breakout player that many people think he will be this year, myself included? I, I mean, I think there's a, a concern about that, but I, I, I think we're sort of brushing that off just based on what he did in those, what, four or five games that he had with Dak last year before the injury. I mean, it looked like he was going to really take off. And I go back to last year, and you look at that rookie wide receiver class, and my take at the time, and I still believe this, is that last year Justin Jefferson was the guy you wanted as a rookie. But if you're talking a longer ceiling for those folks who play dynasty football, I thought C.D. Lamb was the guy with the higher ceiling. So uh, I still believe there's an opportunity for him. You mentioned Michael Gallup. I keep thinking that he is he's kind of the Jan Brady of uh, of that Dallas Cowboys <laughs> offense, right? It's like he, he's a good player and in a situation where he can get opportunity. Yeah, he's probably not going to get the same kind of targets as Cooper or Lamb. Uh, but I think, you know, for folks who are drafting and you're looking for a wide receiver late, Michael Gallup's a really nice option because uh, I think if you're looking for kind of a depth add at the wide receiver spot, I think he's going to get plenty of, of opportunities. I- I'm amazed by the talent of the receivers. You said you might wait at receiver a little bit. I- that's not my game. Um, but there are such good guys available in the sixth, fifth, sixth round. I'm kind of stunned. I would I would start taking them a little early. But of these guys who I all love and think like, wow, why? it's crazy how talented the receivers are getting taken in the sixth round or so. Uh, give me an order, who you like, who you don't. Ayuk, and again, I love all these picks. Ayuk, mm-hmm. Judy, Deontay Johnson, and OBJ. To me, those are all like potentially fantastic values to, to get that late. Um, I would probably go Ayuk first. I'm just, I'm, I'm hashtag team Ayuk all day. So I go Ayuk, I would go Deontay Johnson, uh, Judy, and I, I'm putting OBJ fourth, and that's a hard call for me. The only reason I'm doing that is because I feel like there's such a wide range of outcomes w- with him. I, I, think, I think the guy that we saw for the Giants all those years, that player is still in there, um, but I don't know that, that – the Browns offense is going to feature him the same way that the Giants did once upon a time. They've got two very good running backs. They've got a defense that is going to keep them in every game, so they're not necessarily going to have to sling the ball around a lot. Um, I do think that you know another year with Mayfield and, and Kevin Stefanski in that offense is going to help, but I just feel like there are going to be weeks 
There are going to be weeks when, when Odell looks like the, the Beckham of old and, and he has those spike weeks and he helps you win. Uh, there will also be weeks where they just don't mm. need him and he's just not going to get a large target share. So it could be sort of a roller coaster year for him. He's the flip side of Kelsey, though, to me, where it's like there's a chance he's the you know, wide receiver four. Like mm. when a guy used to get taken in the first and second round and he's getting taken in the sixth round and he's healthy, it's like I, would, I like taking that guy. That in I, general, that's, that's how you do things. I'm a little wary of OBJ being more name than game at this point, as Chris Wessling was known to say. Last thing, real quick, Marcus, which rookie will be this year's uh, Justin Jefferson at wide receiver, and why is it Elijah Moore? <laughs> you know what? I, I do love Elijah Moore. I do. And especially for where he's going in drafts, he seems like a really great value. Uh, but for me, the answer is going to be Devontae Smith. Um, mm. From the moment he was drafted, he was the best wide receiver on the Eagles roster. And maybe this is their you Where know, their, is he their getting taken? Again. Uh, he's going kind of like seventh, eighth round in a lot okay. of spots. Um, you know, maybe this is the Eagles' way to sort of make up for whiffing on Jefferson last year. Uh, but I think he's the best receiver on that roster. You know, the, the one word that keeps coming up when you talk about his route running is just he's a technician. And I do think the Eagles are going to throw the football a lot more than people are anticipating. It's also why I kind of like Jalen Hurts uh, if I'm waiting on a quarterback. Mm. I, think, I think there's something like I think that. there's something there with this passing game in Philadelphia. Mm. You have any is... deep sleepers? I know he said last question, but just like sprinkle a couple of names. Not deep sleepers, but maybe at the bottom of Greg, the Greg, we're on the So my, my favorite deep sleeper at wide receiver uh, is Amon Ross St. Brown. Ooh, um, and and, like and people are calling me that's a USC deep. homer, and that's fine. I'll take that. That's that's whatever. Uh, <laughs> but Because the, 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 whenever, whenever you talk about him, the he name might be their number up, one receiver. The, he, he really might be their number one receiver. It sounds like. But he people also keep one. saying people also keep saying that he is sort of going to be the Detroit version of Cooper Cup for Jared Goff, and if that's the case, that's that's not bad. Love that. Right. That's a great one. Not bad at all, Marcus Grant. Follow him on Twitter. Uh, watch the Fantasy Show on NFL Network, and of course the Fantasy NFL Fantasy Podcast. Thank you, my man. And um, listen, I'm I'm with Martin Lawrence. I, I ask the same question. Stuff like that never happens to me, man. Stuff like that never happens to anybody except for Marcus. <laughs> there he goes. The reboot. It's coming. 2023. Good. Well, one we're on the, the good, schedule. One Greg. of the good guys. You know, we've been here for what? Eight, you've been here longer than eight years or nine years. Like I've been the, here uh, four thousand years. Right. I'm a He's, wizard. Um, actually, one of the one of the glue guys inside the company. So it's great to see him. Yes, we love Marcus. And uh, no, you got in that extra question. You, you kind of try to usurp my power as the host. It's because we're on a schedule and we got to stay on schedule. Now we're three minutes behind schedule. We just got like 12,000 people to draft them on St. Brown in the 14th <laughs> round. And I think that was an amazing deep sleeper pick. Yes. So it's going to help All right. people out. We'll see how that plays out. And we'll circle back to that next year with Marcus. But coming up next on the show. The train keeps rolling. Unfortunately, I do not have a boomerang ref uh, for our next guest, but we're very excited to have him. Uh, he is one of the great fantasy writers out there. I have to thank this man for taking me to my league title last year because I just studied his writings and acted accordingly, and it all worked out in the end. Roto Pat, Pat Darty, welcome back. Or welcome to? Is this second time? First time? I think it's two. I think yeah. We're well, anyway, back. Um, hey, welcome to the Around the NFL podcast from Roto World. Roto Pat, what's up, buddy? Uh, not much. You said I'm one of the greats, but I was heard the end of Marcus's talk. I'm like, Marcus sounds way more prepared than me. Um, <laughs> Marcus sounds really smart and in the zone. Well, you, yeah, there is a reason done. you've only been on once over the years, <laughs> um, Pat. Like an amazing uh, person, writer. Uh, fantasy analysts and um, we, we talk about brick by brick you know a lot uh, dan does on the show yeah you know our listeners might not know you know goal line stand that that's the rankings column over at roto world matthew poliat started it way back in the day and then he gave it to me i gave it to wes and then wes gave it to roto pat here that's the that's the lineage and he 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 crushes those rankings uh, with, with a lot of mirth not even a little bit of mirth a lot of mirth <laughs> We go, we go all in on the mirth and uh, yeah, no pressure following in that group. And I'm glad you shouted out Mr. Poliot where you could probably give people like a hundred guesses who began the football rankings at Roto world. Now NBC <laughs> sports edge and our baseball guru, Matthew Poliot probably wouldn't be one of them, but yeah, Poliot is, 
He's, he's like truly one of the, I, the bricklayer. There's nothing that he did the entire site by himself for five years. So yeah. That's, yeah. He's like, he's, he's pretty, I was about to say he's one of the most unheralded, like uh secret weapons. And he's, he's pretty heralded actually. Like he is heralded, <laughs> he's but decently heralded. He needs to be even more heralded than he is. Matthew Pouliot. He is a true fantasy sports legend. We are going to talk quarterbacks now uh, with Roto Pat, but on the subject of branding and we've, talked about this on the show as well the change in the name of that website do you have to rebrand and pivot to nbc sports edge pat yeah the edge pat like at least edge pat it says many characters so i have such a love hate relationship with the name roto pat like i like the fact that it's memorable and that it's stuck and, and vintage kind of, yeah kind of like i'm like yeah it's vintage now you know everyone wants vintage you know nostal- i was nostalgic before it was like even a thing but you've got children uh, now you're kind of, you're like a grown man and so yeah, yeah and you know that. i like the fact that it's like my name are or whatever <laughs> or like i'm a one namer but i still would have preferred at patrick darty on twitter it's just my irish name way too many characters and so mm. you know back in the day too you wanted fewer they counted like characters against the uh <laughs> like your name characters counted against your character count so if people wanted that's to tweet at call. you yeah. you can't have them mm-hmm. wasting like so many characters on the super long name and that's how that's how rotopat was born well we uh <laughs> love it i i love the i love it as a hook for your whole <laughs> career but now we need to change our focus and talk quarterbacks and uh let's start here let's start here let's talk about some MVPs past and present and maybe future. Okay. Pat Mahomes, obviously the number one quarterback here. The only question becomes when is it too early to take a Pat Mahomes? I think that factors in how your league is structured. Uh, Josh Allen, I imagine we still feel very good about Josh Allen uh, coming off last year's incredible season. How about Lamar Jackson, the 2019 MVP? Why, why not just start there? How do you feel about his prospects as a fantasy gold mine? Uh, this season I think he's still clear top five and you know like what I think was he have the only two thousand I think the three thousand yard rushing seasons in NFL history he has two of them Michael yep. Vick has the third uh as you, you probably know by now like the way you just like bank points and fan like the dual threat quarterbacks are such a life hack and no one banks those like Lamar but you know he was like a little volatile and inconsistent last year we're like like it was nice to have he had like that stratospheric upside with the rushing, but like the floor was like a little lower than it probably should have been. It was like the passing inconsistency. And like what we really wanted for like the next level for Lamar to be like kind of like someone you could almost like safely project as like the QB two, QB one was like that next level in the passing game. And I was so excited to see Rashad Bateman in this offense. Like someone who had success Mm. like both inside and outside in college really felt like, you know, like the missing, like uh, no offense to Willie Sneed, but I'm like, I'm excited to see this guy in the offense. No, take offense. (laughs) Willie's listening, by the way. Uh, Shouts to Willie. Willie, you've had an amazing career, you know, no expectations. He's on the Raiders roster. He's not, you know, don't bury him. He's going to be the number one receiver probably for the Raiders, Greg. Uh, (laughs) And, like this was so excited to see, you know, another first round receiver that maybe someone would take pressure off Marquise Hollywood Brown. And like, this like the Ravens really needed this. And like, maybe even if it's just someone they targeted like over the middle of the field again, even if they never got the outside cooking, you know, like Lamar's trouble getting cooking on the outside, like another guy who can do like major damage over the middle of the field down. If that's the way they want to use him. And it's the fact that he's hurt. I like kind of like haywired the whole thing to me. Mm. And you know, Lamar missing time with COVID. So I guess I'm not actually worried about that. But I want I, I I felt like it was the narrative made sense at least. Like there's an easy next step for Lamar to take this year. He's got like the another first round weapon. And now it's just like it's how do you project like that next passing game? Who are you drafting? Lamar? Who are you taking at quarterback like a lot? Whether uh, it's early or late, early and late. I've got Mahomes is the clear cut number one, but I, you know, I'm still like who's ending up on your teams. You've done a million drafts. So that is, and that is the ultimate test of the fantasy analyst. I know some people, it's like they put these rankings out there and it's like, who's on your team. That's what really matters. If I actually go for like an early quarterback, I've been ending up with Russell Wilson a lot. Like I feel like, you know, one of the most, maybe the most sensible MVP bet there is to me amongst people. that's like not getting like a ton of MVP hype. Uh, I have I mean, not that he doesn't get MVP. I Russell always gets MVP. I have a lot of Russell Wilson, a lot of Matthew Stafford, 
He's still mm, like yeah. going barely in the top 12. I'm surprised by that. I and thought the hype the... would be crazy. And I see he's going after Herbert, who I love, but there's you know a lot of questions there in Tannehill. That that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, there's so much narrative hype with Matthew Stafford that I'm shocked he hasn't like crashed the top 10. You know, with McVay and the best weapons he's had in several years, obviously the best coaching he's had, but he's still kind of like stubbornly that QB 12, QB 13. That's a great uh, but pick. I, an interesting point by Justin Herbert, by the way, where, you know, very good that he set six rookie records, but doesn't he kind of feel like an obvious statistical regression candidate? Mm. Maybe not like a real life play, but like they didn't really do anything. You know, they're changing systems. They didn't really do anything to the supporting cast. Like it's a fine supporting cast. Uh, like as long as like Mike Williams isn't like better line, but I'm with yeah. you. But like, yeah, they didn't like goose the skill supporting cast at all. That kind of feels like some obvious statistical regression to me there. I was getting a lot of Jalen Hurts early in the summer, uh, but I've, I've allowed the Eagles. They have successfully spooked me just with the way they talk about where they talk about him. Like he's just some guy who happens to be on the roster. They <laughs> they talk about him like he's just someone guy who like stumbled in like the team. But still, like, like, I guess we'll give this guy a chance. I mean, I don't know. I, I am stunned looking at the ADP that that Joe Burrow and Trevor Lawrence are like the 12th and 13th quarterbacks. What? Yeah. In what world would you want Joe Burrow coming off a torn ACL after everything? Like I wasn't that excited about him last year, relatively for fantasy or Trevor Lawrence uh, with that surrounding and that coaching staff compared to like a Matt Ryan or Baker Mayfield. I think sometimes people get a little too cute. Uh, like a bake, like, Matt Ryan's going to put up numbers. You just know he is. So if you want to yeah, be 26 safe, touchdowns Ryan. and 12 interceptions. Yeah. Right. And if you want, if you want some upside, take exactly. Trey Lance, like I take Trey Lance or take Justin Fields and don't even worry about your backup quarterback spot in the first month. You can totally wait. Like the, everyone like drafts for week one when they should be drafting for the whole season. And Lance especially seems like he has, you know, top five type upside if, if everything went right. I will say with Burrow, the people are getting finally spooked with Joe Burrow. Like you like, I like philosophical quotes from my quarterback. If they're like over the age of 35, like Joe Burrow, I thought was like talking like way too philosophically, like the summer for like a guy who's like 24. So, what do you mean? Maybe. What, what quotes? He was like, may, the one where he said about like, I don't know, maybe I won't trust my legs again. Uh, I mean, he, he was saying basically that he will get there. Is I that think. philosophical or is he just, I don't, yeah, that I mean, he was just kind of like, I'm getting well like, uh, it's like, maybe this is who I am now. It's kind of what he was saying. He's like, he was like, maybe he wouldn't have like, not that he's a dual threat. Some doubt is creeping in. Yeah, maybe doubt uh, that seemed mentally. to have creeped in understandably. So coming off the torn ACL, but yeah, Greg, uh, the, the Jalen or not uh, the uh, Trey Lance movement that I think people were like, this might have been like Trey Lance week if he had just like exploded over the weekend. He didn't like dud, but you know, it was all like the a, better, all the better. I like that he struggled in the, the preseason because that's going to get people off him. But Shanahan's not off him. He's going to be playing him in a juggernaut of an offense potentially sooner than later, whether it's week one or week six. Like that's so many times quarterback more than other positions. You get guys that carry you that don't necessarily matter that much in September. I will, I will say with Trey Lance, I actually uh, would respect the decision to not start him to begin the, which I almost never say about a rookie quarterback, but like I, I have gotten like a little too fixated probably on the fact that he's an FCS prospect who's played one game in two years. And it was an exhibition, I believe against central Arkansas. So I'm like, you know, just give the young man some time, uh, let him like sponge stuff up from Kyle Shanahan. Just give the young man a little time. Like you said, throw him out there like week six or seven, I have. I actually feel like I don't have a read on what they're going to do with Trey. I kind of actually, I really do believe it probably will be Jimmy Garoppolo week one, but like, I, I kind of believe the rookie is going to start until I see it. Like I just don't pay attention to any coach. Quote. I'd rather have Zach Wilson than Trevor Lawrence and, and Burrow and, and some of those guys up there too. Well, Trevor, I feel like people were like over have been over projecting the legs for Trevor Lawrence. Like he is like a big physical guy and he had the rushing touchdowns. I'm like, I don't know, man, if the Jacksonville Jaguars are really going to be like letting Trevor Lawrence like run in like near the goal line. Are they really going to be exposing him to like these huge linebacker hits? And I think that's the Trevor Lawrence like fantasy narrative has come from. People like pull up a sports reference. Like, oh, yeah, eight rushing touchdowns every year. This guy is going to have like right. a sneaky dual threat. But I'm having trouble 
The, not believing that. You wonder if the Travis Etienne injury now out for the year with that dreaded harlot Liz Frank uh, strikes again, <laughs> if maybe that will make people think, oh, maybe you'll have more of a goal line threat. We shall see. You know, you really captured my imagination there, Roto Pat or NBC Sports Edge Pat with uh, the the idea of the life hack QBs. I like that. I like that. And to me, may, is the ultimate, the guy lying in the weeds as an MVP and as the best life hack quarterback, is it to you? The man in Arizona, the man in the desert, Kyler Murray, another former number one overall pick. Or are there enough red flags, whether it's the personnel around him or his head coach and the scheme uh, and even his own issues with staying healthy and all that uh, last season? Where do you come down on Kyler Murray? Do you think he's a guy that can deliver you a superstar, take me to the promised land season? I do. I'm not sure about I was the media include. I guess I'm including us in the media. We all love Kyler Murray. So I could definitely see like a MVP narrative developing there mm. in terms of like winning fantasy leagues to me. I, so Greg asked me who I was drafting and I didn't somehow didn't mention Kyler Murray. Cause I kind of always just draft Kyler Murray, no matter what year it is, no matter if it's dynasty or redraft and, or he is like the perfect modern fantasy quarterback. Cause the only guy who has more explosive dynamic legs is probably Lamar Jackson. And then amongst like the dual threat types, he's like, I think kind of by far the best passer. Like he's a pure passer, even though he, even though he's a running quarterback too, like he just pure in terms of like the way he like, he likes to pass and you know, like his mechanics. Uh, just, I love his ball placement, even though he's been like kind of he's still like progressing as a passer, like amongst like the guys who really like to run, I feel like he's the best passer. Gets a lot of attempts too, a lot of yeah, volume. Yeah. So much volume. And I just feel like he's like at that perfect crossroads uh, of like the passing and the running where he, he is beyond Pat Mahomes, who is the best uh, American athlete on the planet. I, I do. Oh. I, Kyler Murray. I just uh, get over and over again in fantasy. And like, I feel like he is like the embodiment of what you want in a modern fantasy quarterback. Have you seen Yankees first base with Anthony Rizzo? I thought you were going to say Luke Voigt. Who and I'm, trying to think, traded away. I'm trying to think uh, currently <laughs> if you're right. You're right. I think you're right. Right it's now, not, not like football. historically, but I'm just saying yeah. at this at this moment, Kevin Durant's having a pretty strong, strong uh, year. But, but uh, Kev- yeah, I don't I don't get, though, the difference between Mahomes and like Aaron Rodgers being one round and fifth round. Aaron Rodgers feels like if you feel like going safe at quarterback, there is no scenario that I foresee that Aaron Rodgers doesn't absolutely deliver you great numbers this year. And, and the, it's the flip side to like, yeah, take the Justin Fields that has a top five uh upside but it also isn't bad to just hit doubles and there's no way aaron Rodgers is missing this year there's just no there's no way i don't see a huge difference between him and and the top guys at all i think with Rodgers, it's as simple as people open up his pro football reference they see his 9.1 touchdown percentage from last year bolded because it led the league and people just like well there's no way like his touchdown right. percentage will be that high again. It's fine. His He'll throw 32 instead of whatever. Yeah. I mean, it'll be fine. It'll be great. It'll be fine. Well, what Greg, about- old quarterbacks don't ever have success. Yeah. In this <laughs> what about Dak? Uh, do you uh, have any concerns with him coming off the ankle, coming off this uh, training camp that's been marred by the shoulder issue that's led to the reps and all that stuff? Do you Are you full speed ahead uh, when it comes to Dak Prescott, or do you have some reservations and you're like, well, if I could choose between Dak and say Aaron Rodgers, let me just go with uh, the guaranteed double uh, or the home run, or you say, I'll ride with Dak. He's ready to roll. I think I have allowed myself to become hashtag concerned where it's kind of like a weird situation where I'm like, well, I wish I could just worry about the catastrophic ankle injury. He's come back. I wish I could just focus on that. And like, you can't even just focus your injury, like anxiety from Dak on his ankle anymore. Like, the shoulder, I'm sure it's fine, but yeah, it went from the classic. Oh, he's probably going to practice, you know, like tomorrow or Thursday. To well, we're calling the Texas Rangers uh, just to see what's going on with the shoulder. <laughs> I and, know. Uh, I like when they were like, "Yeah, it's nothing." Um, we're, but we're calling the Rangers because yeah. we have no idea what this is. Uh, so uh, that definitely raised my eyebrow when they, when they were literally called the Texas Rangers to consult about well, his injury. They've got it covered. They've got but, it covered there. Yeah, I hope um you don't hold it against me by the way that like we call Silva the big fish cuz you know you no, I mean, you know it's, it's sharp elbows in the fantasy industry. We're we, we're friends. Uh, you know, obviously Pat, you know we work together long time. Um but I know there's like a lot of a college. lot of resentment potentially to I just uh, to, uh, I, I call him the big dog, not the big okay. fish. Is the only disagreement there where 
Evans. Yeah. Evans, the leader of the industry. Uh, no one at NBC would ever say a bad word about Evan. He he's the god. Um, he's having so much success out on his own. He's he's like the leader of a movement, basically. Evan, I, I worship at the altar of Evan still. He's like wow. a big brother to me. See, it's almost like he's Evan has gained this position uh, of power within the industry that you have to watch what you say because yeah. he's got sparrows <laughs> around him. And if you say something to Evan, he might physically come down upon you. Right. I mean, he'll just stand over you menacingly. Yeah, he'll he uh, Evans a rather rather large man. Yeah, he'll just menace me and make me take like eight Goldschlager shots, uh, which is something that happened one time, by the way. Uh, he's uh, he's a, he's a, he's, a t- he's a tough one to drink with. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to keep up. And finally, uh, my last uh, my last question for you, Roto Pat: R- Which rookie will be this year's Justin Herbert, and why mm. is it Zach Wilson? <laughs> so i've noticed the zach wilson train has left the station i've noticed this theme uh, it has this week it really did I, but people I think, aren't taking him in fantasy drafts he's probably going undrafted sometimes in in one qb leagues no i'm not taking him for the uh the very scientific reason of like when i watched zach wilson's cost so i'm a mizzou alum when i watched zach wilson <laughs> Uh, he reminded me so much of drew Locke, minus the interceptions thrown to linebackers constantly uh, like he, he was like Drew Locke without the turnovers. So I mean, that's good. The way his like physical his college physical resemblance reminded me so much of Drew Locke that like uh, my Mizzou the preseasons PTSD. wiped that away for me. It, yeah. Locke at no point was as like. I'm glad though that Rotopat has exactly. has mentioned this because I did need someone to bring things down a little bit for me after the second preseason game and the the Drew Locke comparison. I, I'm a little bit closer now to uh, to the ground. Thank you. Yeah, just when I watched his film. Uh, yeah, I'm a big film watcher. I'm, I'm a noted film tape guru. Dog. Yeah, a noted tape, tape dog. Fish. And like I said, it was good. It was like Drew Locke without the interceptions to linebackers. So, I mean, that could be really good as a, a player profile. Just, uh, well, well, I'm just taking a day by day with Zach Wilson. I would say I am in on Trey Lance. This, when Kyle Shanahan, I mean, Kyle Shanahan, I was going to say when Kyle Shanahan handpicks someone, he has had not, he's got a mixed track record lately with handpicking people, I'll say. Mm. Uh, maybe beginning with like Tevin Coleman. Um, but when he handpicks the quarterback, Ayuk was was a home run. That's a true. But I thought Dante Samuel Pettis was, was going to be a home run. run. I'm like they traded up for Dante Pettis. I'm going to draft him in every dynasty league in existence, yeah. and then that didn't work out. Are you going to let? Uh, sorry, last last question. Um, whether it's a two QB league or you're just looking for um, a backup, uh, are you going near a Patriot quarterback in this draft? Uh, I mean, I, the only one I would go near is yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Cameron Newton, although he's missing some pretty critical uh, days of camp. This, I think that job felt close to locked up to me for Cam, and things are just set up so beautifully for that power rushing attack. And, like, can't, there's some crazy fantasy stat. I wish I could remember. I think maybe the Lord Rich Rebar tweeted it. But I, I think he had, like, as many top eight fantasy weeks Last year, he had like more top eight fantasy weeks than like only four or five quarterbacks. You know, mm. the other weeks he was like, you know, then like below 30. Uh, but it's, the rushing is just so important in fantasy and they're set up so well to run. But yeah, now he's he's giving Mac Jones a runway to take the job where, uh, you know, Mac has the really – Cam had a successful preseason appearance last week. Mac had the really successful appearance. He's looking good in practice. Tom Curran, NBC Sports Boston, thinks he could – backdoor the job and now cam despite being perfectly healthy because of his uh, coronavirus goof uh you know not knowing the protocol where i was not practicing for like the most critical week of practice of training camp and i'm afraid he may have has, has maybe left the door ajar for, for hmm. mr mac all right excellent work follow him at roto pat uh nbc sports still an amazing site to go to go to, even though Greg left, even though Evan Silva left and Wes left uh, when you have guys like Roto Pat anchoring the operation, they're almost like, I don't know why I'm using a baseball reference, the Tampa Bay race. Like you think, Oh, they can't survive this. They can't survive that guy leaving it. No, yeah. they keep thriving and, and building a, a championship contender. So check out that site. And of course read Roto Pat. And I sincerely do. Thank you. I, I read you every week during the season and, and it makes me a smarter fantasy head. So thank you, good sir. It was truly my pleasure. And you just made me sound like I think I'm the most important NBC employee since Jay Leno. 
Uh, you are, you are. Uh, and you've got a podcast too, which I, I joined like a month ago and I was honking hard about Marquez Calloway and all the little fantasy experts on the show were like, eh, man, whatever. I, I don't and, know. I was and and now, them. now it's, now it's come around where everyone's in on Calloway. Just I would say I have a hundred percent Marquez Calloway exposure as we say in the okay, industry. Good. Now he's going to be a lot more expensive after what happened Monday night. Yeah. But you were right. You were. You've been beating that. Like that wasn't a time. necessary comment. I don't know why. You I only remembered it because his buddy uh, Denny um, reminded me on Twitter. He's, he's been fired. He's been. He we fired. <laughs> he's been let go. All right, there he goes, Roto Pat. Pat Darty, thank you, buddy. There he goes, Roto Pat. Is it just me, Greg, or does Pat Darty have like a Connor Orr vibe that just matches well with this show? Absolutely. He he is legitimately one of the funniest people I know. And Wes would always talk about that too. Like a lot of people, a lot of sports writers think they're funny. You know, Pat's, mm-hmm. Pat's legit funny. But someone on Twitter pointed out something that blew my mind, speaking of Connor. And I, I, I'm wondering for your take on it. You might have to listen to the tapes. Someone noticed that Arif Hassan, actually it was my friend, my friend Adam, who has a great Saints Twitter podcast. Himself. Our guest on Monday show. Yep. Yeah. That Arif Hassan and Connor Orr sound a lot alike. Their voices are very similar. And then I thought about it and I was like, okay, I see that. I Is it possible that. that we are all Connor Orr <laughs> in some ways? <laughs> just like the tone of it and the, the, the way they talk, I can, I can feel it. What if this is all just a simulation and Connor's running it like Algae Rhythm from Space Jam 2? <laughs> I'm in trouble then. I don't feel confident about what's going to happen to me. Like Don Um, Cheadle, you don't have to say yes to everything. If a script (laughs) lands in your lap and it says, hey, Space Jam sequel, LeBron's involved, that's pretty cool. You're going to be the bad guy. Um, Just a heads up, the character's name is Algae Rhythm, and you're a bad guy inside a computer hard drive or something. And you're going to be speaking for uh, 78% of the movie, I would say, Algae Rhythm. <laughs> it's like all Algae Rhythm. It's his movie. Maybe pass. There are some red flags sometimes just simply through a name. I, I'm with you. I'm just delighted that we're having uh, a breakout Algae Rhythm conversation on both of my podcasts because we spent the solid uh, 15 minutes on the Jessel, Nick, and Rosenthal Vanity Is Project. Is that true? Talking about algae rhythm a few weeks. Man, ago, this yeah. this development when your kids start to get old enough to go to the movies and stuff, and you start seeing some of this stuff, it's like, whoa, what is going on uh, over there in Holly Weird? Am I right? Speaking of Holly Weird, our next guest I just learned was on one of my favorite TV shows as like head nurse number seven um, of the show Twenty Four. And, and now, Wait, really? She, yeah, this is true story. I just <laughs> this is research, and this is what pays off. Just like in fantasy. Uh, research pays off. She is now really the boss over at Yahoo Fantasy. Liz Loza, welcome back to the Around the NFL podcast. What was it like working with the great Kiefer Sutherland? That is a, a whole evening we'll have to discuss. But actually, um, I only was supposed to have like three lines in the episode, but I am very good. And this will shock you in no way given uh, my now profession. I'm very good at managing men with short tempers. <laughs> and wow. um, Kiefer Sutherland, in fact, fired another actor and gave me another episode and a promotion because he had a temper tantrum. And, you know, uh, thank you to my mother's dating history. I'm, I'm really good at, at um, managing grown toddlers. <laughs> Wait, you had to calm him down? that mythical for you. How about that? <laughs> That's amazing. I have a, an, I have a great, before we get into running backs talk with Liz, a really quick, great Kiefer story. Um, a friend, this is back when I was living in New York, Kiefer likes to go out and get loose and have fun. Yep. And he's, my buddy's coming out of a bar and who's kind of stumbling out of the bar, but it's Kiefer Sutherland himself. And this is at the height of 24 fame. And the guy, my buddy, he was feeling no pain himself. He went up to Kiefer and says, Kiefer, you're my hero, man. And then Kiefer looks at him dead in the eyes and goes, I'm no hero. I'm a disaster. <laughs> I would say that's pretty um pretty on point for what I experienced. But he, but again, he was very very kind to me, and I, I got myself another episode, which is a whole. I still get residuals from that show, so please keep watching. Wow, that's Dude. great. So it's self it's um self awareness by him at least, and uh, a sign of self confidence by you too that you're 
you've got a small part on this show and that you had um, the confidence in who Liz Loza is to, to be able to talk to the, the superstar and calm the situation down and just realize he's, he's another person. He's a disaster. <laughs> I love this Thanks, story. Greg. <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how we transition out of it, but we will. <laughs> running backs. Oh, well, the running back landscape is also a disaster. Oh, oh. love it. Kind of agree. Why, yeah, why Liz Loza? Why is the running back landscape a disaster in the year 2021? Well, we have a lot of, this is no surprise in the year 2021, but a lot of shared backfields. We had a bunch of injuries just over the last couple of days. We have a bunch of like electric rookies with vets that have durability concerns. And so like this running back dead zone, as fantasy fans like to call it, is a complete cadre of question marks if you will like Ooh. running back 15 to 25 i tweeted my rankings and just wrote bless this mess because <laughs> it could go either way i think you could even extend that after you know the top five or six that there was this i feel like awareness among fantasy heads it's like oh running backs very volatile it's very risky you know wide receivers have as much upside sometimes and are such sure bets. And yet when I look at the average draft position, I'm the fantasy outsider. Now it feels like it's swung all the way back around. Cause I'm looking at all these picks and it's back to so running back heavy early, you know, guys, I mentioned Aaron Jones and, and Barkley getting, you know, first round, but Mixon and Edwards, Alaire and Jacobs and Carson and Montgomery. And like, they're all going in rounds two or three against, the best wide receivers in the league. And just as a philosophy, I don't, I don't buy that. that. I don't, that the I'm, not, I'm not doing it. I'm not touching any of those guys because to me, the, the receivers are all better bets almost. There. Well, you're making a good point because in this like running back dead zone, in this glut of like, you know, running back, like I said, running back 15 to 30, maybe. Um, that is where last year we found Stephon Diggs, for example, right? Like that's where you're going to find some of those receivers, but it is just really hard to look at your roster and not, but also that's where you found David Montgomery last year. So it is hard to look at your roster and not think about all of the facts and the construction and the balance that you're trying to achieve. And also, I mean, I'm not one who likes to say like, I am zero RB or zero wide receiver. I think, and this is something our our friend Chris Wesseling would say all the time, like just take the best player. He'd get so yes. frustrated. Like, I don't what are you trying to do? Just take the guy who's the best at the spot. That's what NFL teams do. Um, so I think there's a lot of a, 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 like a lot of credence to that, and it makes a lot of sense. But I also think when you're actually in a draft, like I'm no I, if if Chris, Chris if Chris Carson is the RB15 and he's available. I am not going to talk myself out of that talent because I know he won't stay on the field for now 17 weeks in a season, right? But that is something that other people will do. So we mentioned Clyde edwards Alaire, and I was one of those people who got sucked in last year. I think I took him in the top 15, and it, it all made <sighs> yeah. sense on paper. And everyone was telling me how special he was going to be. And coming out of LSU, he was such a stud. Um we're hearing now the the hype machine around him is building up again, that he's more comfortable in the offense, that he's been more involved in the passing game, a training camp. Uh, are you buying in on that breakout season that never happened last year happening in year two, or is that somebody to stay away from for you? Well, I'm not staying away from him. He's my RB14 in my ranking. So just above that zone that I was talking about, he's in the on the bubble heading into the dead zone. Um, but I think you've got the draft pedigree. You have what looked to be a special talent at LSU. You also have a lit offense and um, the approval slash enjoyment from Patrick Mahomes. All of these things line up. I would say that he is not the workhorse and is probably not going to be the workhorse we anticipated. But that offense lifts enough that if he can start getting the passing down reps that you're mentioning, then I don't understand why he can't be a low end RB one high end RB two. Hmm. Yeah. And I like the way that their running game looks in terms of their offensive line. They're starting three rookies, Orlando Brown's a better yeah. run blocker. Like they, they, they really got the tape heads excited during the training camp. Cause I mean, during the preseason, cause they're showing a lot more, like a lot more power running and like different schemes. Andy Reid's using the preseason. I think to tell people that like, we are going to run the ball more. I though, like I'm with you, you should always just take every draft as it comes. And, and Wes would say that I always said, like, always be flexible. Just 
don't don't have set rules, but just kind of looking overall, I have a feeling I'm going to think those receivers are better and that you're going to have to take some running backs late and work the waiver wire. I'm going to give you a handful of names I would love at running back. You tell me which ones I'm wrong or, or right yeah. about. Mike, Mike Davis. Wow. I can't believe he's as late as he is uh, for the Falcons. I could see him being a top five to 10 running back uh, in that situation. Javante Williams, love him. Damian Harris, just love the talent. Trey Sermon. I'll even throw an AJ Dillon. Like any one of those guys, if you're not taking running backs early, I feel like you get one later. Who, who's your favorite or least favorite out of that group? All right. So my, fa- so first of all, I agree with you on Mike Davis. I am guilty of, I think Mike Davis suffers from the Tim Patrick syndrome because his name is Mike Davis, it's boring, right? Like yeah. you're just not expecting this baller and all of the attention, frankly, is on Kyle Pitts and Arthur Smith, the former tight ends coach working in this like wide receiver in actuality. So I think he is getting buried a little bit. But of the names you picked, I love Damian Harris. I've always I've loved Damian Harris since he came out. People like to forget that Damian Harris was the RB1 at Alabama ahead of Josh Jacobs, even though Jacobs had all these like flash mm. plays. The knock against him was that he couldn't be a workhorse. And oh, what are we seeing? Like efficiency issues probably linked to durability issues. And so the Raiders bring in Kenyon Drake to kind of solve that problem. We'll see if they can. Regardless, Damian Harris is like a jack of all trades, but a master of none. But he is reliable. And we're seeing Sony. I mean, the Sony Michelle news now going to Los Angeles. We had the clues. The team didn't pick up his option. Bill Belichick gushed as much as Belichick will gush about Harris. Um, and I just think this is a guy who can do everything. They have mm-hmm. a rookie who's flashed in some places, who early on was comped by the RB's coach fears um, to be similar to LeGarrette Blunt. So now I feel like Damian Harris is just forgotten because there is a narrative and we all get stuck in this recency bias nonsense. The narrative surrounding the Patriots is that you never trust a Patriots running back. Well, things change. We saw that, in fact, particularly with the Patriots last year. Dan, that's a nod to you. Mm. And now you have Mm -hmm. Damian Harris as the RB1. I have him as my RB20. You've had some big time Patriots running back years over the years. It, they pop. It doesn't usually go one year after another, but Corey Dillon, certainly. I love that with Harris. Their their offensive line should, on paper, is a top three run blocking offensive line. And especially if Cam starts, they're going to be just running the ball a ton. Who would you rather have, Liz? Jonathan Taylor, who really obviously busted out down the stretch mm-hmm. for the Colts last season, or Saquon Barkley? I have them back to back. It's interesting to say that I have them back six and seven in my rankings. Um, I think when you look, so the conundrum about Barkley to me is not coming back from the knee injury. That's one thing. I think he's going to be explosive. I think he's elite enough of an athlete to re- regain what he was before. The question is, is he going to get the volume that he had the before? And when you notice the fact that he was the high draft capital, the second overall pick and like the urgency on behalf of Gettleman in the front office to protect this investment. He's just not going to see the number of touches and particularly not the number of targets through the air, especially with all of these new pass catchers added to the offense. So I think the issue with Barkley is like, he's not, he'll have the talent. He's just not going to get the volume that we're used to. Taylor to me is a lesser proved talent. There's no Quentin Nelson. I'm not sure about Carson Wentz. I think we probably overreacted to the injury, but I'm still not feeling great about that offense. And Reich loves Naheem Hines and Marlon Mack is healthy. So I don't think we're going to get volume there either. So Mm. overall, when I judge those Mm. two situations, I'm going in the uh, direction of Barkley because talent always breaks tiebreakers. I I worry about Barkley. I I, I would, I would, um, I don't know. Just he wasn't that consistent a runner before he got hurt. A lot of, you know, a lot of like losses, Jason Garrett's the, you know, a lot of, you know, tackles for loss. Jason Garrett's the play caller. I, you, you mentioned I, Wes earlier. That that reminds me, and and our listeners should know Liz is um, on this show because, you know, she's such a, we got to know Liz through through Wes. Great, great friend, longtime true. friend of Wes. He, he, I remember when he called Jonathan Taylor, one of the top five or six running backs in the league around like week 14 last year. I was like, Whoa, like, and, and I think he was right just in terms of pure talent. You're right about the situation is not perfect there uh, for him. But if, if I'm betting on just talent, I actually would go on Jonathan Taylor's talent at this point over Barkley coming off an injury, just because the injury has, mm. it, it, it's just, there's too much, even if there's like a 15% chance that Barkley's like 
hurt and never the same. Like I'm just going to take a guy that's not hurt right now. And jump. I think that it depends on the valuation then, right? My, my issue with not saying that Taylor is as healthy or as talented right now is that he had the benefit of running behind Wisconsin's offensive line in college, right? So that's helpful. Saquon's never had a good offensive line. That still remains the case. And now without Quentin Nelson, I'm worried that like one or two more injuries, what does Taylor's efficiency actually look like? We, we don't know what it looks like behind a, a, a thin offensive line. Um, and my last question for you, Miss Losa, which is, <sighs> listen, Mark Sessler is uh, recovering right now. He's going to be back hopefully uh, either end of this week or next week. So I'm on his behalf, as I did on Monday, I must bring up Jake Funk the number 233rd <laughs> overall pick in the 2021 NFL draft. What does the Sony Michelle acquisition mean for Jake Funk? Can I, I'm not, I didn't know that Mark was sick though. Uh, please give him my best. I adore him and I'm bummed. He's not here to join. Um, I, you know, you work in fantasy when you have nugs on all of these players <laughs> and I am drafting an all rookie squad article that's going to run next week. And Jake Funk, <laughs> was prior to this morning's news um, on that list. Our Charles Robinson, who's our NFL insider at Yahoo Sports, went to training camp and the staff was super high on Funk. They were like, nope, we're not gonna bring in a vet. It's Funk, it's Funk. And then like Xavier Rhodes, I believe his name is, was like running in the preseason. And I was like, well, I said, but then Funk had a really good week two preseason game. I do think when you see Sony Michelle coming in though, although like, man, to like a fifth and sixth round conditional 22 pick is like not a lot of anything. Oh, yeah. But I, I do think we have to then imagine that Sony Michelle is the backup to Daryl Henderson. But I also don't think that they did anything about that until Henderson hurt his thumb. I think that everybody was like, ah, oh, they think Henderson's the guy, they're worried about his durability. Now his thumb's an issue. You see the trade for Sony Michelle, but Sony Michelle's not been the picture of health. I think that Funk is gonna get like, Here's my bold prediction for Mark Sessler. I think Funk is going to have two top 20 fantasy outings in 22 and 21 oh, in 2021. Oh, oh, okay. That There's would something. be a big win. A big win. At this point, yeah. I mean, this is a guy, you know, when he's drafted, hoping that he makes the team. So that's that's a big time number. Uh, it's not out of the of realm of possibility, no, right? Nice little waiver wire Michelle. spike. I like it. Yeah. I like it. They can both Do you have get any other hurt. guys? Do you have any other guys sort of late in the draft that you like? Maybe not that late, but you know, mid mid to late when whenever that that is on a lot of lows of teams that you look. Uh, well, uh, I am drafting. Well, first of all, I'm drafting Robbie Anderson. He's not late, but he's too late um, everywhere. I think he needs to get some respect put on his name. The amount of the like complete rebrand that he was able to handle last year is very impressive. But super late, my guy is Gerald Everett, tight end, former Ram, now reuniting with his former position mm -hmm. coach Shane Waldron in Seattle and I think even if like Russ doesn't cook like even at a simmer Gerald Everett has a chance to be number three in targets in that offense and for a tight end who's going in the like 16th round of 12 team That's exercises I think he's I a great that. dart throw he is their th you're right he's their third receiver they don't have yeah. a third receiver and uh Russ Sneaky likes feeding tight ends he just never has a good one ever they're always talented. hurt too it always yeah, they're always hurt. they always have like seven of them but if you add up all their numbers it always adds up pretty good you're right that everett could could be a little well smart. there's no greg olson there's no hollister and there's no david moore so that's like 150 vacated looks mm. there she is Liz, Liz. <laughs> she keeps she ke keeps poorly behaved men in line and just delivers mm -hmm. fantasy knowledge uh like a faucet running on high and also she gets residuals. What do they call that in the industry? They call that uh, mailbox money. You get that mailbox money uh, from the Fox Corporation every month or so. So everything's cooking for Liz Lowe. So I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I guess everything everything is cooking. Uh, yeah, and we've got F1. But I can't. You guys, you guys have got to have started to watch Survive to Drive, right? Drive to no. Survive. It's I have to. watched I have watched a couple episodes and I, I meant to fin finish it off. Uh, I've watched some F1 in my time a little bit. The kids it was recommended to me highly, that program. I, I have not dove it in fun. yet. It, it is fantastic. I would love actually a Mark Sessler driven pod about F1. <laughs> okay. On the, okay. Inspir in, on the inspirational heels of having watched survive, Drive to Survive. He doesn't enjoy driving cars. You know, he's kind of <laughs> anti food and anti cars in general, but that would be, that would, would make it, I think, an even more mm -hmm. uh, fun podcast. Yeah, there's the hook. <laughs> That's the whole hook of it, Liz. <laughs> I will, I will 
give Mark that. I'll give him your regards and I'll give him that little uh, career tip. Um, but thank you for joining us and uh, best of luck this season and hope to see you at a league tent pole event in the not so distant future. Thanks so much guys. Hope to see you soon. Thanks there Liz. She goes. Liz Loza. You know, Liz was awesome. All the guests. Awesome. This was a really good, strong edition of the fantasy extravaganza as we, we, we seek uh, to give you the listener, the perfect fantasy draft and have the perfect season. And I, it is perfect to me that even after last year's struggles and how he bungled and you'll never convince me otherwise the end of the Tom Brady era that I could still see a headline uh, like I'm reading right now from CBSSports.com. Sony Michelle trade grades colon Bill Belichick works his magic again oh, so while Rams gain stupid. viable running back. You mean the same Bill Belichick that took Sony Michelle 31st overall in 2018? Tell me how these. Uh, draft picks that he's gained in this trade is a indication of his magic. Please, That's somebody stupid. pay attention. That's a stupid. I mean, here's the thing: it's not a bad trade for either side either. But you don't need to make it into something and into it's not. It's two late round conditional picks, which might turn into very little. At most, it's like one. You know, at, at least it's like one late round pick. It's it's nothing. It's just getting to pick an undrafted player <laughs> essentially in front of anything. Uh, it just is a sign they have a bunch of uh, running backs on their roster that they like, and that's fine. Um, yeah, he, a lot he of, has a bunch of yes men still in the media carrying his water. Right, I agree years. with you. This is not an example to make any take one way or another. It's fine. It's fine for both sides. Um, and Sony Michelle was taken over Lamar Jackson. All reports mm. indicate that they were thinking hard about Rough. taking Lamar Jackson. I'll never forget it. And by the way, he was also taken over another Georgia running back taken uh, very soon uh, in that same draft after them named Nick Chubb. So yes, I, I saw your tweets. <laughs> people who are like, Sonny Michelle won them a Super Bowl. And it's like, yeah, I'll never forget that playoff run by Sonny Michelle. They did get one more Super Bowl and he played very well in that stretch. But you don't think they could have filled in that production with someone else, with Antoine Smith or LeGarrette Blunt or whoever it is that they found to, there you know, is. hand the ball off. It's like they would have found great. someone. It was a There's bad There's the pick. Patriots fan in him. It was a bad See, pick. it does pop out every once in a while. Good stuff. Really good stuff. I feel more prepared for my draft. Do you have a draft, Greg? Are you completely out, or do you have I'm a lead? Out. You're out. I have to admit I'm out. Yeah, that's fine. You don't. You don't have to admit it. It's fine. I think yeah, it's last, a way for you to like. Years, it's been good. Sometimes you like you'll do that thing like I'm different. Like I'm not going to get a Peloton. I'm going to get a Nordic track because I'm off the beaten path. I'm not going to do a fantasy league because that's what you do as a basic. I think that's kind of the angle you're playing here, but that's I respect you for what I mean. That says life. more about you about that you that's how you interpreted it. Because uh, of course I did keep a fantasy <laughs> league going one or two for a while after leaving Roto World, but I I found I got nothing out of it. That, I really got I got a little bit of stress and no enjoyment. It's um, funny we even have it's this just like, one a, less thing to worry about. We have this stupid fun league that we do just like uh, Connie Gonzo Mark. Erica, uh, myself, just like a fun little like NFL media hive group. And you didn't even do that with us. And it was just everybody was just like, you know, we were on this private text chain, just like burying you. Like we were all just like, what's wrong with Greg? Why can't he just have fun with us? But he needs to make the stance about how he's above fantasy life. It's like, not above let's it. Speak to that a little bit. It's 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 um, in the immortal words of Don <laughs> Draper, like fantasy football to me. Like, that's what the money's for. Like, that's not really the context it's for at all. But it's like, like, I got into it. I loved playing in those high stakes leagues. Love that Draper quote. I loved the high stakes leagues. I loved, like, playing for my rent or, like, you know, paying for a trip to Japan. I loved playing for the money. I didn't, I wasn't playing for, like, the, the so it goes back to the scratching that certain you're not allowed itch you're not ultimately. allowed to at the nfl play for nah. uh for money nope and um or over it like it's a very small amount of league and it's like oh, what's the point like i i have enough distractions in gotcha me. all right fair enough but for the millions of other listeners um and fans of our league uh this is a big next couple of weeks so best of luck to all of you uh with your drafts and remember my bit of advice I give every year, uh, friends, do let friends drink and draft, but just make sure it's not you. Just hold back on the drinking until you get out of that, you know, 90 minute window of your draft, then cut loose with your buddies. Just that's all I got for you. Do you have any advice for the fans? Great. 
of the sport, fantasy sport, Greg, before we say goodbye? Great advice. Well, it's it's kind of dovetailing off, yeah, that West advice, which I, I really believe in. Don't worry about the rank. You know, draft the team you want Dra- and draft the better players. Like, who's better at football ma- matters a lot more than um, the situation. Like, don't don't worry about being bold. Like, I would much rather have Terry McLaurin than Saquon Barkley. Like, I don't care that it's 30, you know, the ADP that versus six or seven. Just take who you want, you know. Right, if you're in love, fun. if you're in love with the Chiefs and watching Patrick Mahomes and you have a chance to take Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, and Travis Kelsey, do it and just root for the Chiefs. Right. It's all mostly season. luck, it's anyways. Uh, yeah. Old, uh, you know, old Clyde in the corner making fun of you for your pick. He doesn't know anything either. Clyde. Clyde. Is it Clyde Edwards Hilaire? <laughs> I do. I do remember some very making fun um, of you for picking Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Right. It's very. I do remember you know. some very aggressive. NFL analysts bragging about taking Clyde Edwards Hilaire like first overall. It's like people are gonna see. <laughs> people are gonna see. <laughs> All right. We Never saw. again. All right, good stuff. We'll be back. We'll we'll do a bunker cast on Friday, just get you or Thursday, getting you caught up on the news uh, that's transpired since the last Monday episode. Um so uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh but until then, um enjoy this podcast. Maybe bookmark it, listen to it again right before your draft. We guarantee you, we'll win you some guap. All right. The perfect draft. That's what you're going for. Till Thursday. Heed the call.